Hey guys, Hop here. Thank you for tuning into the channel. There have been two big developments in the world of night vision recently. One of them is the influx of inexpensive Chinese-made NNVT intensifier tubes, and the other is the price drop on the Psyonix Opsin digital night vision monocular down below the $2,000 mark. So, I went ahead and bought a Psyonix Opsin with my own money and brought it out to Virginia to shoot the Moons Out, Goons Out 2024 night vision match with Forgotten Weapons, hosted by TNVC and One Shepherd. Stand by. When the Psyonix Opsin originally launched, it was not competitive with other night vision devices on the market, because even as much as digital night vision has improved in the last couple of years, it still cannot hang with even Generation 2 night vision just in terms of raw performance. And at the original price point of about $2,500, the Psyonix Opsin was up against competition from Generation 3 PVS-14 monoculars. So there was really no reason to buy a Psyonix Opsin unless you literally had no other choice. However, night vision prices have been going up a lot lately, and the Psyonix option just dropped sharply in price, so now it may be a competitive option. I got my hands on a Psyonix option and I ran it through an 8-stage night vision shoot here at Moons Out Goons Out 2024, and I think I've got a pretty good idea of how this thing works. Let's get into it. Nicely done. 19504. Excellent. The original Psyonix Aurora is not a night vision device. It is a low light action camera. Just go ahead and ignore all of Psyonix's deceptive marketing practices. The Aurora is compact and affordable with surprisingly good low light performance. It's already more sensitive to light than most cameras, and it has an IR filter which can be switched off to allow even better performance in low light and to allow you to see IR illumination like sensors, lasers, and near infrared from heat sources. You can also see some colors, though not exactly, because color gets really weird when you introduce infrared into the mix. Most importantly, the Aurora is not suited for use as a helmet-mounted night vision device, though that didn't stop some people from trying. Low-light performance of the Aurora is nowhere near as good as even low-spec Generation 2 night vision, to say nothing of modern high-spec Gen 2 or any Gen 3 device from the last 25 years. I still use my Aurora Pro to film night vision content all the time. It's very convenient to use and way more affordable than keeping an extra PVS-14 in inventory. But I've learned to work around the deficiencies of the Aurora. I film stuff on extremely bright nights or as early in the evening as I can get away with because otherwise the footage just looks like green and purple static. The Psyonix Opsin is intended specifically for use as a night vision monocular. It has a totally redesigned layout and control scheme to make it work like a night vision device and not a glorified low-light GoPro. The Opsin is better in almost every way than the Aurora, but it also carries a much higher price tag. The Aurora Pro still retails for about a thousand bucks, but the Opsin came in at twenty-five hundred bucks on launch before coming down to two thousand just recently. Let's start with all of the major improvements of the Opsin, because there are a lot of them. First of all, battery life. The Aurora gets less than two hours of battery life on a full charge, and less than that when it's cold out. The Opsin is powered by an external battery pack, which is also heavy enough to serve as all the counterweight that you need on a helmet setup. From a full charge, I used the Opsin off and on for three nights, and it was still over 50% by the end of Moons Out 2024. The layout of the Opsin is also totally different than the Aurora. The Opsin has a PVS-14 style ocular lens with diopter adjustment and a focus lens at the front. It doesn't just look like a real night vision monocular, it handles like one too. There is a PVS-14 style power and gain control knob on the front of the device. This turns it on and in the original firmware version this was also what you used to control the screen brightness. In the recent firmware revisions, you use this knob for controlling the exposure setting, which is a huge improvement. Screen brightness should probably be kept at minimum because this is a device for use at night, but exposure settings are something you want to adjust on the fly based on lighting conditions. The Opsin also has three buttons on the side of the unit to control it and modify how the device behaves without having to open up the menu, which is kind of the Achilles heel of digital systems like this and a lot of thermal devices. 
The Opsin also has a higher maximum frame rate than the Aurora. The Aurora topped out at 60 frames per second, but the low light performance really suffered if you tried to use it at 60 frames. Meanwhile, the Opsin goes all the way up to 90 frames per second. You can also hold down one of the buttons on the side of the unit to cycle between the frame rates 30, 60, and 90 FPS. Lower frame rates give you better low light performance, but also introduce a lot of motion blur and added effective latency because you have to wait for not just the sensor to refresh but also a new frame to be served up to the display. So if you're looking into deep shadows and you have the time, you can cycle the frame rate down to get a little bit of extra low light performance and then crank it back up to 90 when it's time to move again. And most crucially, the Opsin does have better low light performance than the Aurora. The Opsin at 90 frames does better in low light than the Aurora does even at the lower frame rates. The Opsin also has a couple of interesting features or just quirks of digital night vision. One of the cool new features is called ROI mode, region of interest. Normally, the exposure settings on the Opsin are automatically controlled based on the visible light in the entire scene. So let's say you're watching a dark doorway, but off to the side, you can also see a brightly lit window. The overall scene ends up being fairly bright on average, so the exposure will drop automatically and the door may become totally pitch black. ROI mode allows you to tell the device to prioritize exposure on the center of the screen. So if you look at the door, it will increase exposure to make the door visible. The window will get totally washed out as a side effect, but we don't really care because we're looking at the door. Now take the same problem in reverse. You're wanting to look at a bright area, but the rest of the scene is still very dark. So the exposure is turned up higher than you want, resulting in the bright area being solid white. So you can't see anything. ROI mode tells the device to drop exposure until the bright area is visible. The downside is that everything outside of it will become completely black and impossible to see. ROI mode on the option comes in handy, especially if you're using a bright IR illuminator. A powerful IR illuminator will white out the center of your screen, but because that's only a hotspot in the middle of the screen, the overall screen brightness will still be a little bit dim, therefore the device will try to average it out and it'll kind of give you an unusable image. And unfortunately, because digital night vision cannot handle the same contrast that analog night vision can, you will have to turn it off and on again based on the lighting conditions you're dealing with. For general observation and movement, you probably want ROI off because it will give you the most information about the scene as a whole. So you can see why you want to have the option to engage ROI, particularly when shooting and identifying targets, but you also may want to be able to turn it off. On the newer versions of the Opsin firmware, ROI mode is bound to one of the buttons on the side of the device, so you can turn it on when you need it. Having it on a dedicated button is an excellent feature. The Opsin, of course, is no longer a dedicated camera like the Aurora, but it can still record to an onboard SD card, and that is a cool feature. It may be useful for law enforcement because it's kind of like a night vision badge cam, but it's also just fun for people like me because I can show you first person views down an optic at night and I can record stuff like the moons out match where it's not always safe to have a camera guy following along. You can get various recording devices for analog NV, but they are really hard to use and they create pretty poor quality footage. Some of them are also very expensive. The convenience of first person night vision recording from the option is definitely a factor. And the last interesting quirk of the Opsin is that it has a much broader spectrum of light sensitivity than Generation 3 night vision, which allows you to see stuff like, for example, the LiDAR scanning that an iPhone camera uses to focus. That's more of a curiosity, and it's also not unique to just the Opsin. Photonus Gen 2 Echo intensifier tubes can also see a much broader range of wavelengths. <sighs> Fuck. <laughs> uh, I'm not enjoying this. Uh, oh, God. Right there. <sighs> but as much work as Sonics has clearly put into the option to improve it over the Aurora, it still has plenty of issues. The biggest one is that it still doesn't approach the performance of even Gen 2 night vision. I compared the option to the extremely cheap Jerry 31 binos that I reviewed recently that have Chinese-made Generation 2 NNVT intensifier tubes. As of this writing, you can get a Jerry 14 monocular with a Gen 2 NNVT tube for the same price as the option. 
Real analog night vision, even the very cheap Generation 2 tubes, just has much better low light performance than the Opsin. It handles varied lighting better, has much better contrast, and of course it has no latency or motion blur issues. To really test how well the Opsin works as a monocular, I ran it at the Forgotten Weapons Moons Out 2024 match at the Echo Valley Training Center in West Virginia. I shot with the staff and media group the day before the actual competition. We did all eight stages in one night, and the lighting conditions were as close to perfect as you can get. We had a perfectly clear night with an almost full moon directly overhead in the sky. On any of the stages without overhead tree cover, it was like walking around at high noon. It's really easy to cheat in conditions like that, and just use your unaided eye and your peripheral vision to navigate, only really using the nod to identify and engage targets. Any night vision device will perform at its best in conditions like that, so understand that any issues I had with the Opsin would be 10 times worse on an average night. Wow, you guys look phenomenal right now. It's almost as if it's not dark out. On stages that were out in the open, everything was gravy. The Opsin worked fine, and I was able to even shoot passive very effectively through the MRO HD on my gun, which is not a top-tier night vision compatible optic. The Virgin MRO user versus the One Boob Touch MRO HD user. nothing quite like it, and I don't mean that in a good way. The obstacle course stage and the field of dream stage both had targets at about 100 yards, which were the longest shots in the match, but they were out in the open and easy to identify for me in those lighting conditions. So that covers two of the eight stages, and on the rest of them I was suffering. The first stage we shot was the Hesco shoot house stage, where we had to apply a tourniquet onto a dummy and then clear a shoot house using an A2 carry handle loaner gun with frangible ammo. Point shooting an iron sighted rifle under nods is a fun challenge. Go, go, go right. One, two, go, go take a left in the hallway. Go immediately right. Even though the night was extremely bright and the top of the Hesco shoot house was open to the sky, the shadows inside were very dark and I was pretty much unable to distinguish between the walls and the doorways, so I kind of had to get dragged through the house by the range officer. Into the room. Exit the room. The next stage was the trench run where we had to engage targets at relatively close range from a series of sandbag fighting positions. The entire stage took place under tree cover, and again, despite the high amount of ambient light, I was struggling to see some of the targets. The Opsin doesn't handle contrasting light as well as a real nod, so the light and shadows under the tree cover made it really difficult to see. I also had a problem with my IR laser. I was using a borrowed D-Ball A4, which has two illumination modes. The CQB illuminator has way too much spill. Kind of like with using a vampire light, your loom splashes off the ground and the cover you're trying to shoot from, and that just makes you totally blind. The other illuminator mode is a tightly focused beam, which was just way overpowered for the option to handle on targets that were only about 50 yards away. I was pretty much forced to shoot this and several other stages passively. The pain parade didn't stop there. After the trench stage was the meth house stage. This was another stage, mostly under tree cover, and the first half of the stage is inside a tent. I think this demonstrates how quickly the performance of the option falls off. It was really not that dark, but I was stumbling blind through most of the tent, and I had a really hard time locating the targets once I got out into the woods behind it. For the rest of the night, I didn't have too many issues, at least not related to my night vision device, mostly just my physical conditioning. The match dragged on until about 5 o'clock in the morning, and by then the moon was going down and the shadows became an issue on certain stages. A couple of times I was forced to use the illuminator because I was simply unable to spot the target well enough to make hits with passive. But that meant making a no-win choice between the CQB flood illuminator and the spot illuminator. So on a night with the best possible lighting conditions, the option performed okay. I think you can see why that's not exactly a strong endorsement of the device. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> what model is this van? Boeing? <laughs> it also has some ergonomic quirks that don't have much to do with the raw, low-light performance. Oh, fuck. 
To start with, the eye relief of the option is still very short. I have to smash this thing up against my eye to get a full view through the eyepiece, and I usually like to wear eye pro behind my nods when shooting, and it was agony trying to wear them behind the option. While shooting with this thing at Moons Out 2024, I ditched my eye pro on every stage that didn't involve shooting steel up close because otherwise this thing was just jamming my eye pro back into my eyeball and it was not comfortable. The Opsin also supposedly has a 45 degree horizontal field of view versus a 40 degree field of view for your average night vision device. But this is a widescreen device, so the vertical component is chopped off. The end result is that you feel like you see a lot less with the Opsin than with a PVS-14. The upshot, maybe, is that the busy and cluttered UI of the option is kind of outside of your field of view, like you actually have to get your eyeball closer or move left and right in order to see the various indicators on screen that tell you what frame rate or zoom level you're in, whether or not the thing is recording, audio, video, whatever, and if it's got the various image enhancements on. You kind of can't see that stuff unless you move your eyeball around, so I don't know. I guess it's a wash. Also, despite the increase in frame rate, the latency is still a problem on the option. I know they say it's like less than two frames, but I mean, whatever. It, whatever you're doing isn't enough because you can still see it. When you turn your head wearing the option, your unaided eye is just a little bit ahead of the eye with the option in front of it, and it is fucking nauseating. Also, the resolution of the option seems to be effectively lower than any analog night vision device I have ever used, though it's hard to say for sure because analog night vision resolution is measured in line pair per millimeter instead of in raw pixels. Regardless, it is definitely harder to identify things at distance with the option and also harder to, for example, read text. There are also some weird aspects to the ergonomics of the device. The swing arm that it comes with is not great. It is a dovetail compatible swing arm, but it also is not exactly mil-spec style. You have to adjust it with a tiny Allen key in order to slide it in and out. It's just not as robust or convenient as most J-arms for night vision devices you can get. The Opsin does use the mini rail interface, similar to stuff like the NVM14 and Wolf14 monoculars, so there may be some other swing arms on the market that would work, as long as they give proper clearance for the battery cable. Speaking of the battery cable, the Opsin is only powered by the external battery pack, there's no onboard battery, and the cable connects with a 90 degree straight up plug, and when flipped up on your helmet, the cable kind of gets a little bit kinked. Also, the cable coming out of the top of the battery pack ends up being pretty exposed. You can compare this to the way that the cable comes out on the LLUL21 battery pack. It's just a little bit janky, doesn't feel that robust, and I feel like it could become a serious wear problem over time. Also, just in general, an external battery pack is a lot less convenient than an onboard battery, and the battery life is still not nearly as good as any real night vision device. Psyonix says this will do up to 14 hours with the massive external battery bank, and that's just not as appealing as a PVS-14, which will run for 20 hours plus on a single lithium AA. As far as being a mission recorder or a camera goes, the option is a little bit weird there as well, because theoretically it has a 1280 by 1024 4x3 ratio sensor, but it records at 1280 by 720 which is a widescreen resolution, and that's also what you get on the viewfinder. That's a bit weird, right? What is the rest of that sensor doing, and why can I not see or record the rest of that sensor resolution? The Opsin is also kind of bad at recording video files in a way that the Aurora never was. Opsin files have random black frames interspersed, which just wreak havoc with video editors, so you kind of have to hand break it down, and then you end up with a video file that's a bit shorter than the audio file, and that's kind of jank. That got even worse for me because after the stage where we had to toss a flashbang into the meth house tent, my audio sync went completely out of whack on the option and just never worked again. Didn't matter if I started a new video clip or restarted the device or updated the firmware, my audio was just busted. Also, when I updated my option to the newest firmware, it broke completely. I'm pretty sure I have to send this thing back to Psyonix to get worked on professionally because it can no longer record video files. I have a whole bunch of video files from the third night of the competition, and as you can see, they are all less than two kilobytes in length and contain no data. So, thanks a lot for that, guys. Ian and Jordan from Forgotten Weapons were also using a Psyonix option to record their match footage just from a third-person perspective, and they have the newest firmware, which is how I learned that the newest firmware adds a Psyonix watermark to every single video file, which is just gross. Psyonix, hey, personal note from me to you, don't fucking do that. I think it's probably safe to say that I had the worst night vision device of all the competitors at Moons Out 2024. I didn't see anybody else running digital NV. 
I ended up placing 39th out of 114, which sounds pretty good for somebody with a gimmick setup, but in reality, that's not all there is to it. Like I said, the staff shot all eight stages on one night with ideal lighting conditions. The actual competition was on the following two nights, four stages per night, and the second night was rainy and overcast. Anybody running passive would have been at a huge disadvantage that night, just ask Seedus. You switched off your illuminator, Brock. Is there something wrong? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Use the passive, Brock. Use the passive. Also, this is a forgotten weapons match, so some competitors were using silly gimmick guns as a challenge. Ian shot the entire match with a high point carbine with no optic, just the Maul C1. One of the guys in our squad shot the whole thing with a lever action, which means he timed out on every single stage and racked up an impossible number of penalties. Compared to those guys, my suppressed 14.5 AR was kind of a cheat code. It's also worth noting that for some of the guys at the match, this was a rare opportunity to even move and shoot under nods. It's not easy to find places to do this stuff, so for at least a few of these guys, this was probably an opportunity to practice and not really a place to compete. So, how do I rate my performance? I give myself a meh out of 10. How do I rate the Opsin? Ditto. I'm ashamed to be a part of this. The big question is if the Sionix Opsin has any place in the market right now. Well, if we're talking about current prices and the American market, that kind of depends on how much value add you think that being able to record your first person footage is. Just in terms of night vision performance per dollar, the Opsin still can't hang even after a $600 price drop. However, there are markets where the ownership of actual analog night vision is just not allowed or maybe so cost prohibitive that the Psyonix Opsin actually looks a little bit cheap by comparison. Some of the justification you'll hear for the Psyonix Opsin though is just complete bullshit. For example, the idea that you don't have to worry about burning out your tubes due to exposure from high light. That's based off of a very weak understanding of just how resilient analog intensifier tubes actually are. Not that you should treat them carelessly, but just like walking into a brightly lit structure with your analog night vision turned on isn't going to hurt it. It'll take a lot more than that to actually damage those tubes. Another bogus post hoc justification I've heard for the Psyonix Opsin is that analog intensifier tubes do have a limited lifespan. However, that lifespan is still measured in the thousands of hours, and I don't know if you've ever owned a camera, phone, or laptop before, but they just don't last that long. There is simply no way that a Psyonix Opsin subjected to the same amount of use as an analog intensifier tube will last anywhere close to the like five to 10,000 hours you can expect from generation two or generation three night vision. There are 20 year old night vision devices that are still kicking. Meanwhile, I have to buy a new phone every three years and a new camera every five. I've said this before, but if you're waiting to get into night vision when it quote unquote gets cheap or when quote unquote digital catches up, stop it. You're gonna be waiting a long goddamn time. Gigna. Oh, wow. oh no, not him too. Thank you guys very much for watching. As always, please let me know in the comments if you have any questions. A huge shout out to Forgotten Weapons, TNVC, One Shepherd, and all of the sponsors of Moons Out, Goons Out 2024. It was really an incredible match. I hope to go back next year and they are doing it again. So if you want to show up and shoot the match yourself, stay tuned to Forgotten Weapons so you don't miss the announcement and your chance to register. I will see you guys next time and I will also see you at Moons Out 2025. You motherfucker. So what, did you that's, that's my...